welcome to another knitting episode from me. Uh, my name is Hille, or Hella, as I was called back in the day when I lived in uh, California. That was a hundred years ago. Um, today I live in Denmark. Before I get into the knitting content, and there's quite a bit, uh, I want to really thank you for um, showing up and for showing up to my previous videos. It was uh, rather overwhelming. I think I posted the third knitting video and then it just sort of took off, took off in the sense that it took off for me. I mean, other bigger YouTubers would likely not say it took off, but it took off in a big way for me. And actually the following day I got sick. So all these comments were ticking in every morning. I think I woke up to about 30 new comments and I was trying to answer them, but I was sick. <laughs> Um, not really sure if it was COVID maybe or just the flu or something else. Anyway, I want to thank you so much for uh, tuning in here in my little corner of YouTube. And for those of you who left comments, if you didn't leave comments, that's completely fine. If you did, thank you so much for taking the time to leave all sorts of lovely comments. Um, some people told me what they were knitting, which I found very interesting and inspirational. Others gave me all sorts of suggestions in terms of what yarns they thought I might be able to wear against my body uh, because of the problems I would talked about, about being my skin being um, sensitive. And others just left positive, uplifting, encouraging comments. And I thank you so much. If I didn't reply to your comment. Um, I'm sorry. There were just so many of them and but I read each and every one and appreciated each and every one. I have to say it was just yeah, it was amazing. It also got me thinking that one of the reasons why I think we leave comments in the first place is to reach out and connect to another human being, a fellow knitter. At least that's how I feel. And um, I think many of you do too. Once there's something we have in common with somebody else, uh, especially if we're alone with that hobby, it's it's gratifying to not only connect and comment, but also to receive that comment and to reply back. So I did feel a great need to reply to many of these comments. Uh, there just came a point when, when I couldn't. So I hope you'll forgive me if I didn't answer you, but I can say that I certainly did read all your comments. I do read all the comments. Finally, let me just say I wish we all lived close to each other. <laughs> it was just amazing to get comments from all over the world. And um, it tells me something about the knitting community. And previously, I heard people talking about the so-called knitting community, but I felt I was kind of on the outside of it. Um, I don't anymore. <laughs> and that's thanks to you. So thank you again. Now on to the knitting, of course, which is what you've been waiting for. This is what I'm wearing, my first finished object. And um, if you've seen a previous video, you may have seen me working on it. Probably was almost done with it, maybe uh, lacking one sleeve. And then I had to knit something else. But this is the pink velvet sweater by Andre Maori. And um, I quite like it. I think it's appropriate for spring. Uh, not only the colors, which are bright and springy after a long, dark winter, which apparently isn't quite over here in Denmark, at least, but also the, um, the yarn. Let me show you the yarn. It's made in uh, king fiber and it's, I couldn't believe it, but I, I didn't realize the weight of the yarn when I bought it. I was just enamored um, with the color, the colors, uh, the sort of, um, duck's egg blue of the main color and then this hot pink of the uh, contrast color. I was drawn to those colors and didn't really worry too much about anything else, which was a mistake. This is what I have left of the contrast color. Can you see that it's slightly variegated? It's really lovely and it's a cashmere merino blend and it's super wash. And then this is um, super wash merino in a sort of duck's egg blue. And you'll notice what I didn't think about, but which I certainly did think about when I began it, that this is like sewing thread. It's lace weight. I mean, at least I had to hold it double, but still double lace weight. What is that? Fingering? If that, um, oh, I think it is fingering, but still 
very uh, thin threads, so I didn't think about that. <laughs> what I also didn't think about was that when I came home and read the um, label, it said for this one, it said may bleed or bleeding may occur. And I thought, oh gosh. What I did was I untwisted the skein and put the yarn into, um, into water for a little while and let it soak. And uh, I could see from the water that some of the color came out. So that was nice. I probably should have done it a second time, but I, I just wasn't really thinking about it all that much. Um, so by the time I was done with the sweater, I did begin to think about it again and probably also worried a little about it. So what I did was I made a swatch. Okay, so the original swatch that I'd made, I had already unraveled because I don't necessarily keep all my swatches. The minute I find, find out what my gauge is, I often unravel uh, because I'm always worried that I won't have yarn enough and I'm not going to use the swatch for anything. So I typically unravel it. Um, I shouldn't have done that in this case. So I made actually another swatch, just some random um, pattern. And then I let it soak in water with white vinegar because I'd read that that would um, make the color stick to the yarn. Uh, I figured if, if that didn't discolor the blue, then it would work for the sweater as well. And it didn't. So, you know, I was just, um, I rested a little easier when I then uh, left this to soak. It looks pretty good, I think. This is, of course, um, this is with a shirt underneath because it's still a little cool. And it's not, it's not winter in Denmark, but it's not really spring yet either. And also, I knitted it on, I think, four millimeter needles. And I think for the sleeves, I probably should have gone up half a needle size. I've heard about this before, that people uh, tend to knit more tightly in the round on sleeves. I just have never found that to be the case, or at least I haven't noticed. This time I did notice. So, you know, they're a little snug on the sleeves. So right now I prefer to have a shirt underneath, but that's the plus of it being superwash, which I also hadn't noticed before I'd already bought it. Uh, but I think superwash is supposed to um, stretch a little more and I'm fine with that. I don't like things that are too snug, but I do like actually the boat uh, neck and I'm going to like that for spring, I think, without a shirt underneath. I just want the a little more room uh, on the sleeves. So I think that's what I have to say about the pink velvet sweater. The pattern was really easy to follow. It was only the second time I knit a pattern in English. The first time I knitted a pattern by an American designer. And that was a good experience because I want to be able to not just knit Danish patterns because that's obviously going to limit me. And also I need to uh, be more familiar with English knitting lingo because as I've mentioned before, I've begun to translate uh, some knitting patterns. So I need to know, you know, what's actually said in English. And it's completely different from Danish, I find. Um, there are so many abbreviations that we don't have. Uh, it's really interesting. I think I'm getting the hang of it. I hope so. Let me just take a sip of my tea. This is um, pukka tea, green tea, mint, by the way. Love pukka teas. Just wanted to quickly show you what it looks like without a shirt underneath. You can see the boat neckline here. I love that. I like the neckline a lot. And I can wear this right next to my skin. So that's lovely. I forgot to mention that the pattern calls for a long tail tubular cast on which I think I'd done only once before, but thankfully there was a video that demonstrates how to do it, which was helpful. There was also a bit of shaping with short rows at the back. The pattern calls for two tubular bind-off rounds, which I did, but instead of the Kitchener stitch for the finish, I did an Italian bind-off, which is also sewn, simply because I'm more used to it. A lot of Danish patterns, especially and Wenzel's patterns, use them. She has a good video tutorial for it if you're interested. 
Before I continue to other FOs, past and present, let me just address the pink elephant in the room here. This is my whip, my current work in progress. And I showed you the yarn, I think, in a previous episode. And this is uh, the Sarang sweater by Agio Knit so far. I'm on the second sleeve, as you can see. It's a pattern that's coming out, I think, ne next week, because I'm nearly done with the translation. And um, I think some of the some of us test knitters are nearly done. Um, and um, you can see here that it's a pattern that, or it's a sweater that um, has all over an all over cable pattern, and then um, it's got this little lace panel. Uh, near the bottom before a final uh, cable section. It looks a bit puffy right now, but uh, they assured me that it's gonna bloom and block out really evenly. So I, I hope so, because of course um, the cables are gonna make the fabric contract quite a lot. And then the lace is much more sort of open and takes up more room. I love that design. It's quite boxy and a little cropped, but I think it's gonna stretch a little when I block it. And uh, since it's oversized, it's gonna sort of um, maybe be a little longer in the sides, I think maybe, or at least it's gonna drape nicely. So yeah, I think this is just beautiful. Um, what can I say about it? It's knitted top down. You start from the back and then you knit the back and with these welts and then uh, the beginning of the front and then you join in the round under the sleeves. And then you continue down here and of course create the lace pattern. You do go down half a needle size, at least I did, uh, for the lace. One thing I noticed is that my gauge changed a little when I moved from knitting cables flat to knitting them in the round. I decided after having written in the, in the test chat not to worry too much about it. I did switch a little back and forth between needles but I think also some of it's going to block out and some of it is just going to be what it is. I, I don't want to worry so much about it. Um, you know I think it's going to be okay. But certainly I knit that uh, I can highly recommend it. Um, it's interesting. It's also time consuming of course since it's all over cables and then lace. Uh, the cables are knitted on four millimeter needles and the lace three and a half millimeter needles, I think. Four millimeter is a US six. So that's relatively small needles, but not toothpicks. So it's okay. I'm looking forward to seeing it finished and to see other versions out there. And let me just show you the yarn again. So yeah, I, I don't know if I have enough left, so I may have to... Um, get hold of some more before I can finish it. This is the Cashmere and Lamb's Wool by Biche et Buche. And I'm holding it with a Le Petit Silk and Mohair by um, Biche et Buche. This is very light pink and this is nude pink. I wouldn't actually call this pink. This is like a light powder color, but um, I like the fabric that it, they create. It's slightly scratchy, but I'm told that that's also going to uh, disappear when it's been washed and when it gets a little spin cycle, because that's apparently something that makes cashmere bloom a lot. I didn't know that until somebody in a yarn shop told me. And I have actually tried it and nothing happened, even though I was afraid. Okay, so that's what's on my needles right now. Um, one more thing is on my needles, but it's only just on my needles. I wouldn't even call it a whip because it's not a work in progress. It's actually just a cast on, I guess you could call it. But I think I showed you um, the skeins of yarn for the snow crocus by Midori Hiroshi. This is the caked up yarn. They look completely um, bold. They look like colors I would never knit in. If you've seen what I've knitted previously, you'll know that I'm, I like neutrals. I don't only like neutrals. And I also want to say something about the word neutrals. There's a problem with the word neutral. Um, neutral is like not taking a stand, like Switzerland, like not wanting to be um, in, in anybody's camp, if you know what I mean. 
but the neutral colors surely are not neutral in that sense you know it's not like they haven't taken a stand they've just taken a stand on the other side of the color spectrum from the bold colors at least to me that's the case um, so these are certainly a step away from the neutrals but interestingly they create a, a completely different color once you knit them together I've almost just cast on as I said so you can't really tell but look at this I mean bright purple and bright green dusty blue <laughs> I mean it's kind of it's kind of like magic you can tell when I move it closer that it's purple with green but from afar honestly dusty blue right I love it so much and I can't wait to continue to knit on this but I've had the test knit and uh, of course you're wanting to finish a test knit for the designer there was only one afternoon where um, I was waiting for some instructions because there was something unclear in the pattern and I had an afternoon of nothing to knit on so you know I couldn't let that sort of pass by I had to do something so I cast on for the collar and that's as far as I've gotten can't wait to continue also because it's on uh, well the collar is five millimeter but the body will be on six millimeter needles so um, that should be good before I mention uh, a future project that I already have the yarn for I just want to um, cast back to uh, yeah no pun intended but cast back to some past FOs because a few people asked me uh, what the K facet sweaters I had knitted 20 plus years ago looked like uh, and unfortunately I don't have them anymore I don't know what's wrong with me but um, since I met my partner 20 years ago I've gotten used to throwing things out that I don't use for a while um, I think at heart I'm kind of a hoarder my mom was a hoarder I remember uh, cleaning out after she passed away and found I think a box of 50 pairs of white short socks 10 of them in packets that have never been that had never been opened so there's a hoarding gene in my family that's for sure but I've gotten used to cleaning out and not just having stuff all over the place so as I mentioned I used to have a completely different hair color and uh, to me that decides or at least decided partly what I uh, liked to wear of course back then I was also I was a student and um, I'd traveled in Asia and been really sort of <laughs> a bit more hippie like so I gravitated toward bold and um, happy colors if you will so I found an old picture or a couple of old pictures of me wearing one of the Cape facet sweaters I forget what it's called now um, but it's got intarsia and it's got a lot of crazy bold colors that I just loved back then and I think it it went well with my red hair I also made another K facet uh, sweater I'll insert a picture of the vest that I made it from well there's a cat sitting here hold that thought okay I just had to go and let the cat in okay the original pattern was a vest and I didn't want a vest I wanted a sweater or cardigan I forget at any rate I knitted the body and then I picked up for sleeves so I could have something that was a little more useful I recall having all these little uh, yarns sort of little balls of yarn hanging on the inside because it was also intarsia because there's all these little houses and I think I knitted on a three millimeter needle and I think also back then as I've mentioned before I didn't know a lot about swatching and I'm not sure swatching was really such a thing at least nobody told me about it uh, so I think I knitted it quite tightly and I think that sweater I gave to my aunt which is what I did for my fir the first sweater I ever knitted I gave to my aunt as well because she was smaller than me that was a lot of hours that I could have spent more wisely had I known to swatch I also had an Aran sweater from back then which was my favorite sweater I wish I knew what yarn I knitted it in I might not be able to wear that yarn today but it was such a gorgeous um, heathered yarn 
and the pattern was just lovely. I wish I knew what pattern it was. I would knit it again today. It was a completely oversized Aran sweater in these autumn -y colors. And again, I had red hair, so I wore it so much. In this photo, I'm standing with my brother who had just won um, a golfing tournament. And now was this caddy. Can you picture me on the golf course wearing a very ungolf like outfit? I also knitted a sweater for my brother, uh, one of those classic Norwegian sweaters with lots of um, color work and colored a colored sort of uh, ribbon here and little pewter locks. Yeah, it was what people, I think, knitted back then. And I also knitted a couple of designs by a Danish uh, designer called Mayana Ise, but I have no photos of them and I have none of the sweaters left. I don't know why I, well, I probably wouldn't wear them today because times have changed and that's okay. I lament a little that I didn't at least keep the Aaron sweater because I love that one so much. One other thing I wanted to mention about being a knitter years ago is that I was always a monogamous knitter back then. And I think one of the reasons is that you couldn't buy yarn online. You, there was no such thing as Ravelry or YouTube, of course. So there wasn't inspiration all around you. And I had one knitting friend, my friend from the Faroe Islands, who taught me to knit. And so, you know, we talked to each other about knitting, but it wasn't like left, right and center. People were showing me different patterns. So I got yarn at my local yarn shop. I got a pattern from my local yarn shop. And every time I was finished with one sweater, I'd go down to my local yarn shop and see, OK, so what now? You know, it's just it was so much simpler um, <laughs> for better, for worse. So uh, also I was a student, so I bought yarn for one sweater at a time. And even back then, I think I didn't knit a whole lot of accessories. Did I knit a scarf? I might have and maybe a pair of socks. But apart from that, mm, I gravitated towards knitting sweaters as I do now. Yeah, so now I'm still to a large extent, a monogamous knitter. But I will say when you have something like this uh, on your needles or anything that requires your attention or, well, it doesn't actually require my attention all the time. There's a lot of smooth sailing with the cables. But if you have color work or anything where you really need to pay attention to a chart or anything, it's actually nice to have some stockinette uh, knitting or something on the side if you're um, wanting to watch TV or talk to somebody. But I do like to finish things and not have too many things on the go. I think partly because I'm afraid if I go down that castanitis hole, I'm not going to be able to stop. And also, I just, I want the finished object. So the next thing I want to mention is the next project I'm, I'm going to be working on when I finish the Sarang and maybe begin uh, or continue the Snow Crocus. But I will be doing another test knit for Aegyo Knit. And it's the Sion Kimono, which is just gorgeous. I'm going to be translating the pattern. So there's something um, logical in, in knitting it first. Aside from the fact that I think it's just beautiful. Uh, interestingly to me, um, the Sarang sweater has this sort of, um, I don't know, to me when I saw it, I thought Mulan, as in the Disney princess or the Chinese princess or war heroine or whatever she was there's something like a to me it's like a modern take on something that Mulan could have worn and the same goes for that kimono so it's kind of a Mulan fantasy <laughs> for me um, so I was completely unsure of what color to choose for it um, and it's um, a Danish yarn again it's uh, two strands. One of them is uh, silk, silk mohair, this one, which is like a light powder. It's the color six. Yeah, it's a light powdery color. Beige, I guess. And I was, I actually wanted the, the other strand to be similar to this in color. So I had chosen a skein. I'd chosen a ball of yarn in two different colors to see which one I preferred. And I chose these two. This is Isa Trio or Trio One. So you can see these two different colors. This is camel and this is powder, I think. Yeah. Camel and powder. And 
on the screen on the computer this one looked lighter um to me this is just a little too dark for me um and this is of course rose uh, kind of a dusty rose so i was completely unsure of which one to to use i've knitted two swatches and you probably can't even tell the difference here well maybe a little i think the light is not helping me right now but anyway this is the camel one and this is the powder one yeah they're so close so you get the picture and, and of course it, it's neither here nor there which one i choose but i think the reason why i'm not going to go for this is that it's going to look weird on me i typically don't look great in something that's very dark camel i had hoped that it would be closer to this but you can see they're kind of far apart in color um whereas this is perhaps a little closer so even though when I showed my partner the two swatches, he said, haven't you made quite a lot in this color? And you know, you hate hearing people say that. It's like when he said over the winter, haven't you knitted quite a lot in gray? I'm like, yeah, because I like gray. You know, and, and these days, currently, I apparently like knitting in dusty rows. Uh, so I think it's easy to be swayed by other people's comments and choices sometimes. Um, and you can easily feel guilty about choosing a color that you've knitted several things in before. Or um, if you hear other people express a dislike for, for instance, neutrals or pink, or for that matter, bold colors, you can feel almost um, wrong if you choose something other than that. And I think it's important that we sort of search ourselves and um, feel, you know, what would actually bring me joy? what would I wear? What would be best for me, regardless of what others think? Uh, and that, of course, goes for many things in life, not just knitting. So right now, I think I'm gravitating toward the rose. So that's going to be next on my needles. And I can't wait because it's, um, it's I think, like the Eurus sweater that they made. It's also knitted from one sleeve to the other. And I think there's quite a bit of brioche and knits and pearls. So that's going to be interesting. But first I have to finish the sarang and that's going to be a while yet. Another FO is actually uh, something I can combine with acquisitions because uh, some months ago I knitted the Bowie sweater for um, Caroline of Agio Knit as a sample knit. So I didn't keep it. And it was a really cozy, oversized sweater. I put it on to check the fit and I really liked it. It's very oversized. It was knitted on a size six millimeter needles, which I think is an, is that an eight or nine, US eight or nine. So it's a pretty large gauge and it went relatively quickly. It would be a nice project to have to alternate between if you've got cables or something that's a little more um, intricate. It was Isa Aaron Tweed held with uh, Issa silk mohair. And the Aran Tweed was a bit scratchy, rustic for me. But I knew I wanted to knit one for myself once, that I, uh, once I'd knitted it and tried it on and really liked the fit. I was pondering what yarn to try uh, because it had to be um, Aran or worsted weight, but soft. And also, I wanted to do the pattern justice. Bawi means, I think, stone or rock in Korean. Most of their names are in Korean. So I wanted a yarn that would create that rock effect. So I finally decided on um, this yarn, Puno, by the Danish yarn company Gepard Gan, which is uh, the same company that I knitted my Abba sweater in that was poor Alana and uh, Kit Sita. This particular uh, version of Puno is called upcycling and it's 68% upcycled alpaca, 10% upcycled wool and 22% upcycled polyamide, which I think is that um, the chain that the rest is sort of blown into. So it's very, it's mulesing free. Uh, it's made of waste from their own spin mill. So it's very sort of, um, the word so i'm very excited to try out this yarn um it's got these tiny um specks i don't know if you can see them 
in Danish, uh, the color here is called Hygge <laughs> Um So it's basically um, not your typical spring knit, but I don't really care. I really want the Bawi sweater now. And also the Danish spring can be quite chilly. So, you know, it's going to be a while until we don't wear sweaters for me at any rate. And also I need something to take with me on the on an airplane because we're going to go to New York City over Easter. So, uh, you know, I need to be I need to have some yarn and some knitting with me on the plane. I don't think I'll, I'll be finished by with this by that time. And I have a feeling that the brioche is going to be too, you know, there's a lot of turning. So it's going to be maybe a little too complex to bring on the plane. Last year when we went to Edinburgh over Easter, I brought knitting with me. And that taught me a valuable lesson in terms of what yarn to bring on, a, on an airplane and what yarn not to bring. I brought with me the Frankie Genser, which I knitted in white brushed alpaca from Sentness Gan. And the little sort of um, fluffy things from the yarn just tended to sort of fly everywhere as I knitted. And we flew Ryanair. And we didn't want to pay extra to be seated together on a plane ride that would take an hour and a half at most. So we sat in different parts of the plane. So I sat next to a Scottish gentleman and I noticed a couple of times that he just sort of removed the yarn from his... Uh, black trousers and I was like so sorry I'm so sorry and he's like no worries no worries you know very kind and completely uh sweet about it but I felt really bad because it just kind of went Phew. so that taught me you know you don't bring any old yarn on an airplane consider if it's something that's going to shed I think this one is safer uh because even though it looks very fluffy I think it's not something that will shed quite a hmm. I hope it won't I know uh, silk mohair will quite a lot, so that's one reason not to bring along the yarn for the Sian kimono. So anyway, that's um, a project. Hopefully I'm gonna begin before Easter or at least over Easter. And a word on yarns, because a few people wrote to say, well, a lot of people wrote to say that it was very interesting to see all the Danish yarns. I don't only use Danish yarns, but I have mainly so far plus uh, some Norwegian yarns from Sentnesgan, uh, which I think are um, available pretty much anywhere. But a few other people uh, wrote to say, oh, I wish I could get your yarns, but I'm not sure I can get them anywhere near me. And I can un completely understand that. Um, I did look up to see where you could get some of the Ise yarns and some other Danish yarns, Gipatgan, for instance, which is this one. And I know that you can get Gipatgan at Forever Yarn in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And I think you can get some of the Isea in Espace Tricot in Montreal. And in addition to that, uh, of course, you can get it in various European stores in Stephen and Penelope, for instance, in Amsterdam. A shop that's on my to-do list for sure. I've been to Amsterdam a couple of times, love Amsterdam, but I wasn't a knitter then. So, of course, it didn't strike me to go see it. Um, but so I hope you will be able to find it if you're interested in that. I've seen mention of the Isa yarns and other North American podcasts, so they are available somewhere. Those two shops are the only ones I'm aware of, but I can completely understand how it's, it can be maybe a little annoying to see yarns that you can't get because some of the podcasts that I've seen, there's so many beautiful yarns that I can't get a hold of here. And as we're going to go to New York City over Easter, I really would like to find them. And there are three specific yarn brands that I would really like. And one of them is Sonder Yarn. Uh, I know it's Canadian. And on their website, it says that they're not shipping internationally yet. Uh, and also, you know, buying yarn from across the Atlantic Ocean is going to be really expensive. The shipping cost is one thing, but then you get the value added tax. And in Denmark, well, we have the highest value added tax in the world. That's 25%. So that's ridiculous. If I could buy that yarn in New York when I was there, I would. And there are two other yarns that I just, I'm so enamored with that I've seen on um, various podcasts. One of them is the yarn from The Lemon Kid. 
uh, gosh, they all look gorgeous. Um, the Todd, the Elmer, the Birdie, the Mo. Uh, gosh. Um, but, you know, that would also, it would be a heavy price once the Danish VAT is put on top. So I'm reluctant to try that out. I don't know if, I don't think you can get them in any store outside of their own store. And that's fine, you know, but just know that I'm, uh, I'm tempted as well when I see it. And then finally, um, the knit collage yarns. I think they look so beautiful and so strange. And it's amazing because when I first started knitting again, the second time around, a little over a year ago, I saw some of those uh, sweaters made in knit collage and I'm like, what? That looks completely weird. I'm not into that. And I thought the same about various other uh, kinds of yarn or patterns. And lo and behold, these X number of months later, I've just completely changed my mind. And I think that's something that happens maybe when you begin to make your own sweaters. One thing is what you would buy in a store. But another is once you start knitting yourself, you don't want to knit just the same basic gray sweater. Uh, as I said before, you know, they're lovely to wear, but I'd like to have new experiences for every knit or somewhat new experiences at any rate. The knit collage yarns look to be such fun and some of the patterns look just really interesting. So I think they do ship internationally, but again, 25% on top of that. Mm. If I could find them somewhere in, uh, in New York City, that would be great. Just a word on test knitting. Six months ago, I wasn't a test knitter at all. And I had this perception of test knitters that they were sort of in a league of their own on Instagram. It's, it certainly appeared that way to me, especially when they would sometimes, you know, flaunt the yarns that they'd been sponsored. And I thought, wow, these people are really VIPs in this knitting community. And if any of you feel that way, you know, don't. It's completely random. And it's, you know, there are pluses and minuses about being a test knitter. And one of the pluses is, of course, that it's a privilege to be the first to knit a pattern. And it's, of course, a huge privilege to get yarn sponsored. But I spend so much time providing feedback. I know not all test knitters do. Since I've been a proof uh, reader and copy editor, that's how I go about looking at a, at a pattern. I comment on everything, every little comma and full stop and compound noun that should be not a compound noun etc in Danish there are different rules you know so I comment on everything because I think that's my responsibility as a test knitter and of course now I also um, translate some of the patterns so I go about it in a very sort of um, I hope responsible way and certainly um, professional way um, so it's not just being sponsored but also I think some of you wrote to me that, oh my gosh, you must be such a fast knitter. And oh my gosh, you've uh, produced so many knits in one year. And yes, I have produced a lot of sweaters in one year compared to some people, compared to others. It's nothing. And therein lies the problem but that we do tend to compare. And we shouldn't. This should be made for the sheer joy of it. And if you compare yourself to me and you feel you come up short, stop watching this. Uh, but know that... Uh, there is no comparison unless you make that comparison because, I mean, we're all here to um, have fun with it and enjoy it. And I think it's in human nature to compare and we often feel that we don't measure up. And it's such a shame because it really takes the joy out of something that is just, you know, there is no knit police. There is no deadline for when you have to finish the sweaters you've chosen to knit etc. It should just be made based on what you want. So try not to compare, even though I know it's hard. And when somebody else seems to knit more than you, just go, eh, okay, clearly they have no life. <laughs> clearly they haven't moved a lot, which is what I told a couple of people, you know, when they said, you must be a fast knitter. No, I said, I've just spent many hours on the sofa, on my butt. Uh, and there's a downside to that. I wish I could walk while knitting. So I, I feel like I haven't gotten a whole lot of exercise, not as much as I used to before I started knitting again. Oh yeah, and something else. I follow a couple of people on Instagram who are really good knitters, but it seems like they've 
just committed to test knitting now. They don't choose patterns uh, on their own a whole lot anymore. And to me, that's just not so interesting because I like to see what people choose. That's the inspirational bit, not just the whole sort of, now I'm knitting somebody's pattern because I'm a test knitter and I can get the yarn sponsored. That's just, it's not interesting to me. So I'm very mindful of not wanting to just be a test knitter. Uh, I want to knit my own things. I've got a long queue. I have so many dream knits lined up. I just don't want to sort of present them all and then only knit maybe one or two of them because I, you know, things take time and that's okay. But I do want to show you a couple of other acquisitions. They're not recent acquisitions. Well, one of them is, but there's two yarns and I want to show them to you simply because I want to show you that I knit in different kinds of yarn. And one of them is this, uh, brushed alpaca by Sentnesgan. This yarn or this particular color for some reason has been discontinued and when I bought it it was like almost half price. Unfortunately they only had seven skeins left or seven balls of yarn left. This is like a foggy blue I would say. It's clearly blue except it's also somewhat gray which is one of my favorite colors that zone between gray and blue especially when it's this sort of misty dusty looking but i don't quite know what to make with this since they only had seven balls of this color left uh, there are a couple of things i wanted to knit but i think i used this particular yarn for my frankie Genscher in white and i think i used eight or nine balls for that one and that was a bit oversized so I knew I couldn't knit something of that shape. I bought this pattern thinking I might want to knit that with it. Um, this is just a very basic uh, kind of puff sleeve sweater by Sentence Gone. Uh, I think it's cute, but then I realized after I bought the pattern that it's bottom up. And of course, bottom up didn't phase me 20 plus years ago. In fact, that was all I knitted. I think that's all any of us knitted back then. But now that I've started knitting top down, I really, I'm not sure if it's something I want to do. Um, if anyone knows of a pattern that's similar to this, but top down, feel free to write it in the comments. So anyway, that's one of the yarns I have uh, for something I don't know what. And one more yarn that I have is a very, um, inexpensive yarn and I bought this on sale as well and this is drops air I haven't tried knitting anything in drops yet and I know a lot of people have talked about it as being uh, one of the least expensive yarns um, this is color 33 and it's a kind of uh, I think it's called gray or rose stone or something like that so it's I don't know if you can see it the light is changing here all the time but it's kind of a dusty grayish rose color light and that's probably the rose color that I gravitate toward the most these days anyway and I don't really know what to make with this either something with kind of lace pattern or something with structure on the top part of the yoke sort of like the ranunculus but not necessarily the ranunculus or maybe something completely different a sweatshirty kind of sweater i don't know and also um in my yoga class there was somebody who had knitted the snowy forest sweater in drops air in a gray color it looked beautiful from afar but when i got close to it the sweater felt as if um, it would pill quite easily and also it to me it looked as if for a structural knit you might want to add an extra strand of something like brushed alpaca silk from drops or kid silk or something to to um, give it a little more structure I don't know does anybody know so the jury is still out when it comes to what I should knit with this and it may be a while yet since I have, um, yeah, 11 balls of this lying around plus the kimono. Um, but all good things. Oh, and the final acquisition is the book that everybody's been talking about for the past few weeks. It's actually quite heavy. And of course it's this 
don't you just love the way it sort of offsets the sweater? But this gorgeous book, Neons and Neutrals by Amy Gilles, which of course you will have heard of by now because it's been everywhere. I actually got it like a week or two before the so-called launch date. I'm not sure why. And it's interesting, isn't it, that a lot of us gravitate toward the same patterns here. So one of the patterns I had loved before, long before I got the book, was this one. In both those versions, actually. They're so beautiful. Of course, it helps that the models are really beautiful. But that's one of the ones I thought about, uh, along with pretty much everybody else. I told myself I bought this in order to gain more knowledge about knitting language for translations. But of course, it's absolutely also for um, the inspiration. I think the one I probably love the most of all of them is this one. So beautiful. Apropos kimono and Mulan fantasy. She's just, oh my gosh, so gorgeous. But all the patterns, I mean, look at this. The shawl. Wow. Stunning. That would definitely be dream knits. But um, it's such a lovely coffee table kind of book that really I just kind of want to sit and uh, stroke it and flip through it and be inspired. And also, of course, I love the whole neon to neutrals um, title of it, which is very much what I think I'm gravitating toward these days. Either the same old neutrals in various versions or something that's completely different, apropos this sweater. Oh, and one final thing, something that I forgot to mention in the video where I talk about how I um, planned and knitted the spot sweater. One thing that for some reason I completely forgot to mention is with that much color work, um, there's going to be a lot of ends potentially. But years ago when I knitted those intarsia sweaters, what I did was I would always, when I had a new yarn or any color work that I made back then, I would always sort of twist the new yarn around for a couple of uh, stitches and then just sort of um, weave them in as I went along. And I I didn't know if it was a thing you could do. I just did it to save myself time when I was done knitting it. And so when I began uh, knitting again this time round, I was like, oh, is that actually, can you do that? And so for a while I didn't do it because people were talking about how long it took them to weave in ends once they'd finished a sweater. And I'm like, okay, apparently you don't do that. That's not what a serious knitter does. So I didn't do it for a while until I stumbled on a video by Stephen West, I think it's called Weave and Stephen, where he does that. It's a Weave and Stephen technique now. So I did it for the spot sweater, so it saved me a lot of time towards the end. So you can you can find the video simply by googling or going on YouTube and finding Weave and Stephen. Uh, but Stephen, I did that 20 plus years ago. It was just my own little knitting hack. But now it's a thing. Uh, so if you want to save yourself some time when you uh, either knit the spot sweater or any other color work sweater or any sweater for that matter, weave in the ends as you go along and honestly you can't tell. Um, I tried to do it in this one. I tried to do it somewhere and I think because it's uh, lace weight held double and the two yarns are very different in color, it was a little more apparent so I didn't do it as much in this one. But when the yarns blend well, it's no problem. You can so easily do it. So that was my uh, tip for the day if you're not already doing it, which probably you are. And there are probably a million things I've forgotten to mention here. Um, but in that case, I will get to them in a later video. I hope the light worked. The clouds are sailing by my window here. Um, and the sun is shining in between them every now and then. And then it hides behind a cloud. So the light changes all the time but you know at least there's light so thank you so much for tuning in and spending a little time with me here i feel like i'm babbling half the time uh because this is not scripted so it can feel a little difficult also because i'm searching for words half the time i hope that's okay that's also why i will edit this video it's not just one long take because it would just be too annoying to listen to, I think. 
even more annoying than it is now. But I wish you happy knitting and I hope you maybe got a little bit of inspiration or sense of connection or motivation or maybe just entertainment while you uh, sat around with your knitting. And I hope that you're doing well wherever you are. I hope spring is going to be on the way here soon. And, and let's see where I am with these projects uh, in the next video. And also, of course, the whole concept of spring knits is something I should get into. Well, we'll see all about that. Thank you so much. And I will hopefully see you next time.